Every stone tool follows a journey, born from nature, shaped by human hands, used, discarded, and sometimes rediscovered long after its maker is gone. A single Clovis point can tell us more than just how it was made. It holds clues to the lives of the people who crafted it, the landscape they moved through, and the world they left behind. It can even give us clues as to what it's been through since its divorce from its maker. Thousands of years ago, someone shaped this stone into the perfect tool for its time. With practiced hands, they struck the raw material, flaking off slivers until a razor-sharp point emerged. Maybe it brings down a mammoth. Maybe it shatters on impact. Perhaps it's lost, sinking into the mud and forgotten for millennia. But its story isn't over. This point was found in the northeastern United States, where the Clovis culture once thrived. In this video, we'll reconstruct the life history of this tool and use it as a window into the world of these people. This is the life and death of a Clovis point. In June of 1966, Hurricane Alma ripped through the Atlantic coast, reaching Category 3 strength with winds roaring at 130 miles per hour. As it moved north toward the mid-Atlantic, the storm surged over barrier islands, flooding back bays and reshaping coastlines. Before weakening and drifting further northeast, Alma pushed waves and tidal waters deep into places like Atlantic City, New Jersey. It also brought with it enough force to churn up ancient sediments. In the days following the storm, a man by the name of William Freeland was clamming, recreationally, near Drag Island, in a lagoon along the coast of New Jersey. Fishing and clamming have historically been lucrative industries in New Jersey, and the Great Egg Harbor Lagoon was known for its supply of northern quahog clams. Freeland was sifting through a shoal just north of Drag Island with his clamming rake when he witnessed the oddities that Hurricane Alma churned up. Among them were large shells, some bones, and some historic artifacts. Freeland took notice of one object in particular, though. It was a Clovis point of prehistoric origins. To us archaeologists and people generally interested in North American archaeology, a find like this represents a rare artifact with fascinating insights into the ancient world. Others have been found around the mid-Atlantic, but they are few and far between compared to more recent technologies. For those who are unfamiliar, Clovis points represent some of the earliest stone tool technologies in the Americas, dating to around 13,000 years ago. I made an entire video on this technology and the people that used it, so if you want a deep dive, I'll leave a link to that in the description. But this point exemplifies the archetypal Clovis form, fluted in everything. It also exemplifies the presence of now submerged Clovis sites along the coastline. Archaeologist Anthony Bulgerian has documented it extensively, and it's what we will be analyzing in this video. To understand it completely, though, we have to examine the material from which it was shaped, which takes us back hundreds of millions of years. The story of this Clovis point begins not with its human modification, but with its geologic origins. Not all rocks are created equal. They range in quality from color to structure to geochemical composition. Depending on the physical properties of a stone, it will make for a better or worse tool material. Humans have long recognized this natural fact. Studies looking at stone tools used in the Middle East during the Middle and Upper Paleolithic show that these people were intentionally selecting materials best suited for the particular tool being made. For Clovis points, the ideal material needs to be malleable enough for shaping, tough enough to hold an edge, and not so brittle that it shatters easily while in use. Finding this balance is crucial, and ancient toolmakers became experts in recognizing the best lithic materials for their needs. Clovis people may not have categorized rocks as we do today, but through trial and error, they learned to identify stones with the right properties. Over time, their selections became more refined. Among the most prized tool stones were cryptocrystalline rocks, stones so fine-grained that their crystal structure is invisible to the naked eye. These materials were favored because they break in a predictable, controlled way when struck, producing smooth, sharp edges. Geologists and archaeologists describe these rocks as having conchoidal fracturing properties. A conchoidal fracture doesn't split along a pre-existing natural line of weakness, like how wood splits along its grain. Instead, they fracture in a smooth, 
curved pattern that doesn't follow any internal structure of the material. This kind of break creates surfaces that look like the inside of a seashell with rippling patterns, which is why the term comes from the Greek word for shell. When struck properly, these materials break predictably, creating sharp edges, an essential trait that made them highly valued for tool making in the Stone Age. A defining feature of a conchoidal fracture is the bulb of percussion, a raised point where impact occurs, sending out shock waves that leave those ripples in the surface. So what type of materials possess these ideal fracturing properties for Clovis point making? Among the most common are some of the following. Chert, flint, and jasper, all variants of the same silica-based rock type, were the primary cryptocrystalline tool stones of the time. These sedimentary rocks form in marine environments, often as nodules or layers within limestone, and were the top choice of material worldwide, let alone people living in North America. Obsidian, a natural volcanic glass, obsidian forms when lava cools rapidly, preventing crystal growth. This results in an incredibly sharp edge, so sharp that modern surgeons have experimented with obsidian scalpels for their precision. Quartzite, originally sandstone, quartzite forms under immense heat and pressure, fusing its quartz grains together into hard, durable rock. Though not as easy to shape as chert or obsidian, it was widely used for heavy-duty tools. And argillite, this fine-grained sedimentary rock, rich in clay materials, was also used for tool making. However, its fracturing properties were less predictable than the cherts, and it became more common for later Native Americans in the mid-Atlantic United States. Anthony Bulgerian has identified the drag island Clovis Point as Helderberg Chert, specifically. The Helderberg Group is a geologic formation found in the northeastern United States, particularly in parts of New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey. This sedimentary rock formation took shape during the Devonian period, which spanned from about 419 million to 359 million years ago. At this time, the Earth was very different. A massive supercontinent called Gondwana was home to countless now extinct species. Sharks were in their early stages of evolution. Massive, 8 meter tall fungi called prototaxites were among some of the most strange terrestrial biotas. Today, Devonian outcrops of Helderberg limestone are abundant with fossils from brachiopods, crinoids, and ancient coral, reminiscent of those ancient times. It was in this geologically archaic world that the very material of the Drag Island Point was born. This 400 million year old jet black chert was identified by a nomadic Clovis hunter who recognized its potential. We don't know exactly how the Drag Island Point was extracted, but Native Americans and other prehistoric people used various technologies to dislodge chert nodules from bedrock. Stone wedges would be jammed into cracks and driven in with hammer stones, which would have been assisted with wooden pry bars. This would help lever off smaller, usable chunks. After the material exposed at the surface was depleted, they may have dug to find more or abandoned the site entirely in search of a new outcrop. They left evidence of this quarrying in various forms. On the landscape, this is evident by shallow pits and sometimes larger vertical shafts leading to mining branches. Formations like these can sometimes occur naturally, so to increase our confidence, we must also check for artifacts. Many Native American quarries doubled as workshops, so we often see evidence of tool making at these sites in the form of stone flakes, unfinished points, and sometimes full points that were discarded. If the landscape and the artifacts both indicate a quarry site, it might just be one. It is at this point that human modification commences. A stone that has laid dormant for millions of years will now embark on the human journey, accompanying a Clovis hunter as they endure the end of the Pleistocene. They begin by breaking down their large, irregularly shaped chunk of chert into a size more suitable for flint napping. They strike the stone with a hammer stone, another rock, carefully chosen for its hardness and weight. With each precise blow, flakes fly off, revealing the chert's glassy interior. The hunter knows exactly how to angle each strike, reading the stone like a language. The goal now is to create a preform, a roughly shaped blank that will eventually become the deadly yet elegant Clovis point. Once the preform takes shape, they switch to more refined tools, perhaps a piece of antler or bone. This method, called pressure flaking, allows for finer control. Instead of striking, they press the edge of the stone with force, popping off tiny controlled flakes. With each careful adjustment, the edges become thinner, sharper, and more lethal. The final shape emerges, 
a long, thin profiled, and symmetrical spear point in the shape of a leaf. We generally call this a lancelet point. To create the flute, the hallmark of a clovis point, the napper carefully prepares the base by thinning it with pressure flaking. Then they deliver a controlled strike at just the right angle. If done correctly, a long, narrow flake detaches, running up the center of the point, leaving behind a smooth groove. This fluting process is risky. Too much force and the point could shatter, which actually happened quite often. But when successful, it creates a lighter, more aerodynamic weapon that can be securely hafted onto a spear. As you can see from the sketch, the flute on one side took three flakes to achieve what the napper wanted. The Clovis hunter runs their finger across the edge, testing the sharpness. The point has passed the test and a tool was born. So what was this ancient stone tool used for? Well, let's take a look at the environment that this individual was dealing with to get a better idea of its possible functions. Around 13,000 years ago, when groups of Clovis people were roaming North America, the continent looked much different. The earth was undergoing a major transition. It was escaping the last glacial period of the Ice Age and was entering an interglacial period. The Pleistocene was on its way out, but the eastern United States was still much colder than it is today. At their peak during the last glacial maximum, a little more than 20,000 years ago, glaciers extended as far south as northern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Long Island. By 13,000 years ago, they had retreated into present-day upstate New York and New England. Today, Drag Island is only about three miles from the Atlantic coast. However, during these more glacial Clovis periods, sea levels were so much lower that the landmass we call New Jersey was about twice as wide, and Drag Island was about 62 miles west of the shoreline. In fact, Drag Island probably didn't even exist. It was probably just a landform adjacent to the river passing through at the time. Subarctic conditions in the region resulted in taiga forests. Spruce, pine, and other coniferous trees would have dominated. As you moved east toward the shoreline, the trees were less abundant and the environment was more tundra-like. Some of the fauna that ran through these ancient landscapes would have been nothing like what we see in New Jersey today. They include caribou, muskox, mammoth, bison, and mastodon. Fossils from these extinct species have been found deep on the continental shelf, submerged under many feet of ocean. These were the potential targets of the Drag Island Point. After hafting the fluted base to a spear, the Clovis hunter, along with their close-knit friends and family, went in search of these megafauna, with the hopes of taking down something big enough to feed the group for days. But this brings us to a long-standing debate in Clovis research. Did they actually hunt these megafauna that were available? I dive deeper into this in my documentary on Clovis, but some of the arguments supporting the idea that Clovis people hunted megafauna include the temporal correlation between the Clovis people and the final extinction of many megafaunal species, and archaeological evidence of kill sites where megafaunal remains have been found alongside Clovis points. On the other hand, arguments against Clovis people hunting megafauna include the lack of direct evidence. While Clovis kill sites exist, they are relatively rare, and it cannot be ruled out that many of them could be evidence of scavenged butchery sites instead. And some experiments suggest that Clovis points may not have been capable of penetrating the thick hide and hair of animals like mammoths. The debate is much more complicated than this, but those are some of the key points. As far as the Drag Island Point is concerned, it probably wasn't used for such a task. Bulgerian notes how the distal end lacks evidence of crushing or fracturing from use, for example, impact force. This suggests it wasn't thrust or thrown as a spear. However, both macroscopically and under low magnification, the blade edges exhibit moderately ragged edges as pre-depositional damage or wear from use. Therefore, it seems as though this point, specifically, was used for cutting, slicing, or butchering. Archaeologists found a Clovis base camp at a chert outcrop in Ohio called the Welling Site. The reason why they considered it a base camp or hub is because it consisted of much more than just quarry debris. They conducted microware analyses on an assemblage of fluted points and other stone tools discovered at the site. Accordingly, they found a variety of stone tool functions, 
including dry and fresh hide scraping, hide cutting, meat butchering, sawing and scraping bone or antler, and sawing and scraping wood and plant remains. It appears that the Drag Island Point served similar purposes. It's a great example of how not all archaeological discoveries represent the grandiose story of taking down some giant mastodon. To the people who used these artifacts, they were often just aspects of everyday mundane life, a life so far removed from ours. For a time, the Drag Island Point was an extension of its maker's hand, a tool that bridged the gap between human ingenuity and survival. Perhaps it rode at the hunter's side for weeks, tucked safely in a pouch or bound to a wooden shaft. But no tool lasts forever, including this one, even though it showed no signs of slowing down. With the high rate of breakage during the napping process, many Clovis points never saw any action. They were ditched as incomplete preforms. Ours had a life history that survived birth and was most likely used for food or hide processing or woodworking. Judging by its unbroken body, it was entirely serviceable when abandoned by its owner. You could imagine that someone living a hunter-gatherer lifestyle would be totally averse to ditching a perfectly usable tool, that they would cherish their handy tools. Was it replaced with a better Clovis point? Was it simply lost during a migratory tread through the taiga forests of Paleo, New Jersey? We don't know, but we have a decent idea of what happened to it after it separated from its owner. Our main clue is that the Clovis point is water-worn, this suggests that the artifact was subject to fluvial activity, which is a fancy way of saying its surface was affected by moving water. Running water often picks up grains of sediment, holds them in suspension, and transports them downstream. This is significant for archaeologists for two reasons. First, this can help explain how certain archaeological sites are buried within sediment, or how the sediment of a site is eroded away. Second, artifacts within these waters are bombarded with sediment particles. Given enough time, the abrasion will lead to the rounding of edges and the smoothing and polishing of stone tool surfaces, which looks to be the case for this Clovis point. Since the point's surface tells us that it has been knocked around by water activity, it is highly unlikely that where it was found, just north of Drag Island, is where it was initially lost or discarded. It may have been dropped far upstream, on a river terrace before being washed away and transported to the Great Egg Harbor Lagoon. Or maybe it was dropped closer to where it was found, but on a landform that pre-existed the lagoon 13,000 years ago. Then, as water levels rose, the point was lifted and knocked around before being covered with lagoon sediment. Interestingly, the point does exhibit some more significant impact fractures, but they are the result of the clamming tool that scooped it up. So there you have it, the full life cycle of a Clovis point, as far as we can infer. Note how it is not a grandiose one. It does not tell us the story of a stealthy mammoth hunter who broke their tool upon stabbing a wild beast. Rather, it tells us about the day-to-day -day life of that hunter, finding a rock suitable for shaping extracting and napping it to fit their needs, using it to participate in everyday tasks like processing dinner, and misplacing it on their travels or replacing it with an even better tool. It also elicits some excitement for the future of coastal and marine archaeology, given the vast expanses of land that were once inhabited by Paleo-Indians but are now submerged underwater, countless sites and artifacts are waiting to be found. State archaeologist Greg Latanzi has documented further instances of fluted points washing the shore along the New Jersey coast. They are out there. We just have to start looking. Future research geared toward uncovering submerged prehistoric sites will be challenging, but artifacts like the Drag Island Point tell us that they are there and can be found. If you enjoyed this video, drop a like and subscribe to support the channel. Consider subscribing to the Point2 newsletter for more content and Evolve Point2 updates. A link to that will be in the description. And check out this video on screen for more Mid-Atlantic and New Jersey archaeology. I'll see you in the next video. Stay curious.